we've got our final panel, which is going to be focusing on the use of technology in one of the most critical areas that we've got today in, in, in uh, facing uh, big issues, climate change, sustainability, etc. We are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Cassie Rouser, who's going to be our moderator today. Um, we've had a chance to develop a great relationship cross campus with, uh, with Cassie. She's the executive director of uh, UCLA Sustainable Grand Challenge uh, effort and has been leading uh, an effort towards Los Angeles being one of the most uh, uh, basically sustainable cities, mega cities, uh, by the year 2050. So a big uh, aspiration there and activities. She served on the committee that originally developed the first sustainability plan for LA uh, County. She's got a bachelor's uh, in uh, biology at ASU and a PhD in ecology and uh, evolutionary biology from UC Irvine. So Cassie, I'll turn it over to you. We're very fortunate today to have with us several decades of experience from folks working in the green tech industry. Um, we have two panelists with us here today on stage, and we have a panelist joining us from Austin, Texas, virtually here. Welcome, Michael. Um, after I introduce the panelists, um, we'll begin with a handful of prepared questions, and each panelist will have about two to three minutes to address each of those questions, and then at the end, we'll have time for audience questions that are submitted through Slido. So I'm pleased to be here with um, our three panelists, I'd like to first introduce Camille Terry. She is the co-founder and CEO of Charger Help. Camille, will you please provide the audience with your background and the role you play in your company? Sure. Oh, that was a lot this louder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm still loud. OK, it's fine. Um, well, I started off working at a company called EV Connect. Um, actually with a lot of Anderson grads, so it's really cool to be here. And I um, actually started off as a driver support there. So literally any time an EV driver had any type of experience with the charging station, um, I was the lovely voice they got to speak with. Um, but over time was able to grow um, with EV Connect and stand up several departments there. And by the time I was ready to move on to you know, my next venture, uh, I saw that there was this massive hole in the industry around um, fixing charging stations quickly. And that's really where the ideal of Charger Help came about. We launched in 2020, uh, right before uh, everything. <laughs> um, but, you know, today we service about 20,000 charging stations across 11 states. We have 33 employees and um, has closed on about 4.25 million in venture capital. Um, so it's been a very exciting experience and um, a, a, a critical experience to help with uh, mass EV adoption. So yeah, and I'm the CEO there. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much. And we also have here on stage today, uh, Laura Bean, who's the president of North American Vestas and American Wind Technology. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, you bet. And your role in the company? First of all, just thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I started in the industry actually a long time ago, 1995. Um, I found my first job on a job board that was physically on a three by five card at my university. This was before the internet, so it tells you how old I am. <laughs> um, and I just kind of fell into the industry, honestly. I was just looking for a job to pay the bills while I was studying for what I thought was going to be entrance exams to law school, but ended up doing a business degree instead. And I worked with that same company that over a series of acquisitions and name changes became Iberdrola, which is a very large Spanish-owned utility. And I was ultimately the president and CEO of their North American renewables business. Um, we built out about 7,500 megawatts of wind and solar across the US over a period of about 15 years there. Um, I then went to NG, and I actually know Michael um, from NG. Um, and I was brought in to try to help integrate a series of acquisitions of renewable companies that they had brought together to try to create an integrated um, in their pivot to clean energy. And then most recently, I've joined Vestas, which is the world's largest wind manufacturer. Um, we're headquartered in Denmark, um, but our North American headquarters are in Portland, Oregon. All right, great. Welcome. Thank you. And with us virtually is Michael Weber. Michael is the CTO of Energy Impact Partners, 
the Joe C. Centennial Professor in Energy Resources at the University of Texas at Austin. Michael, can you give us a little bit of background and sort of the role you play both as an academic and at your company? Sure, and thank you so much for having me. And I hope you can hear me okay. I hope I'm not too loud or too soft, but uh, it's good to be part of this. I appreciate the invitation. So as you heard, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. I'm doing research and education on energy systems at the University of Texas. And I teach classes like thermodynamics, but I also teach entrepreneurship. I teach a class called Energy Technology and Policy, which is for graduate engineers, upper division engineers, but also MBA students, policy students, and geoscientists. So I'm in different places on campus with my professorial role, trying to create the clean energy entrepreneurs or the policymakers or the leaders of the future, this kind of thing. And then I also have a hat as a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, as you heard, for Energy Impact Partners, which is a $2 billion clean tech venture capital fund. And this fund's really focused on the energy transition, and it has funds dedicated on typically underrepresented entrepreneurs, deep decarbonization, flagship funds, credit funds, European fund. And if you have any ideas, say like you have an EV charging company, you need funding, then you should talk to me after this. And we can uh, talk about what your funding needs are because we're looking to invest in the energy transition because it's a, a big opportunity. It's already on the way here. It's what the world needs. And we see a, a lot of ability and need to accelerate things. And so there as a venture capitalist, but as a technical guy, I don't negotiate valuations or anything like that, but I do screen the technologies. I'm constantly looking for entrepreneurs and investable teams and companies. I'm trying to do some due diligence on the technologies. There are a lot of great ideas out there. Some of the ideas violate the laws of physics or thermodynamics, so I'm there to make sure they don't. And uh, also just trying to sort of have a wide net on what the possibilities are. And as Laura just mentioned, I was at NG for three years. That just ended. I was Chief Science and Technology Officer at, at NG, headquartered in Paris, France. And I was a C-level executive for the global company. It's a big company, 170,000 people in 70 countries. And uh, I had about 450 people reporting to me from the research divisions and sort of the entrepreneurship divisions at our labs in Paris and Brussels and Chile and Singapore. Singapore, and I'm just back from Paris, back at UT full time now. So I have sort of the macro corporate view, the entrepreneurial view, and then the professorial view, and really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Great. Thank you, Michael. So many different interesting perspectives. So we're going to jump right into our questions since we only have about 50 minutes today and we, we have a lot to cover and want to hear as much as we can from these great panelists. Um, the term green tech, I'm sure as you all know, can mean a lot of different things and covers diverse portfolio of technologies aimed at protecting and conserving the environment and our natural resources um, or repairing, of course, damage that we've already done. So today we have panelists representing energy and transportation technologies. Um, I'm going to start with you, Laura. Um, can you tell us more about what attracted you to your specific sector? And then a description of what other green tech sectors you most closely collaborate with. And then what are some of maybe the challenges and or benefits of breaking down the silos and collaborating across the different sectors? Great. Um, as I mentioned, I just got lucky and fell into the energy industry and I've never looked back. It is a fascinating industry. And actually quite early in my career, I was thrust into the renewable realm. Just a couple of years after starting in 1997, I was the analyst to evaluate the potential market for clean energy in the United States um, across the utility sector. And it just really struck something in me. And then, you know, not too long after that, I went over to the deregulated energy side where we started to build out wind energy. And I have become an absolute wind nerd. I, I <laughs> adore wind energy. I am literally every time I come to one of our sites and I see them spinning, I get goosebumps from head to toe. It's never gotten old for me. I just think they're amazing machines. It's amazing technology. It's a complicated, dense field and it's just a fascinating space to work. I've really spent my whole career in the energy and generation sector, um, but we're definitely starting to see more collaboration between transportation. Clearly, there's such a need to ensure that what is being charged is being charged with clean energy, right? Otherwise, it sort of defeats the purpose. And I think there's really wonderful cross collaboration opportunities that you're starting to see, of course, enabled more and more by technology. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. Michael, why don't we move on to you since you also hail from the energy sector and, and maybe give us your perspective on this, at that same question. Yeah, I, I'm really just enthusiastic about energy because I think it's fundamental to everything we care about in society and that in many ways energy is the defining element of modernity. 
if you want to have a modern society, that means energy. And we use energy for our water and our food and our transportation and everything. So it just feels like a very important thing. And uh, I came to that conclusion, actually, as a freshman in college, and I was studying the history of early civilization and the history of the early church. So I was an aerospace engineering student as an undergrad, but also got a liberal arts degree. So I did a lot of history and culture and philosophy and language and that kind of thing. In studying early civilization, you start to realize what are the components of a modern civilization. And for me, it was energy and water, the two fundamental ingredients. So I really like energy. And if we look at the way energy makes a transition over time, it's from solid fuels like wood and biomass and coal to the liquid fuels like whale oil and kerosene and other petroleum derived uh, refined goods, then gaseous fuels, and then you get to electrons. And then you also get to, as part of that with photons, but also bits and data. So data and energy seem to go hand in hand as part of this natural evolution as we go through this transition over a couple hundred years. And as we do it, generally speaking, it takes society to a better place. And it reduces poverty and improves our lifespans. It has many good things with it. There are, of course, many downsides like pollution and contamination of water. And we have to worry about national security concerns and economic risks from price volatility. And we have to worry about inequities and in access. So there are a lot of challenges with energy. But if we do it the right way, energy can be really good for us as a society. So I really think about like the goodness or the potential for goodness from energy. And with technology that just in data, we think about the information that flows with it. Energy enables information and information enables better energy or managing energy in a better way. So this seems like a natural marriage. And just I think both are really important and pretty exciting. Great. Thank you. That's a, a great description of how energy really intersects with all the other different sectors. Um, so Camille, you come from the transportation sector and what drew you to that sector? And um, do you have any experience collaborating outside of that sector with other green tech sectors? Sure. I love it again. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so for me, it actually was a little bit more pra practical. And I actually think that it's a good representation of where we're going to start seeing more people come into the industry. So. Out of school, I actually started in a nonprofit, then was a banker, and then I just really needed a job, <laughs> to be quite frank. And EV Connect was hiring at an entry level position, and then getting into the space with a very practical job, um, I started to see how, most importantly, how pollution was impacting folks from my community. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, and I think that a lot of times we don't necessarily know how much. A pollution it's it's this health crisis that we're experiencing and you know understanding why so many people in my family might have asthma or lung conditions my co-founder both her parents actually passed away from some type of issue with their lungs and they're from compton which sits in the epic center of multiple freeways so while it was a very um random event of me to be in the industry um now being a part of it and seeing how much it impacts everyone um, it's very exciting to figure out how do we get more people into this industry. So when I think about adjacent industries that we're currently working with, for us, is most the, the biggest ones, is, it's really the government um, for us and trying to figure out how do we bring the government into these conversations, whether it's through workforce development centers and agencies or through um, figuring out different um, standards that may need to be enacted to ensure that all of this new technology is regulated in some type of way um, so it's very exciting for us, period, right? Uh, but then also being able to be an example of more folks that might want to enter into this industry that didn't start off um, in energy prior to. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you. Very interesting. I know when we talked, you talked about the way that the transportation infrastructure popped up was through all these different pathways, um, and 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 I. I see what you're saying now of how the government should step in and help regulate this, right? Because if you think about charging infrastructure, right? You know, like a school system might put it in or, um, you know, right? And some of them were uh, monitored and some of them weren't. So they're breaking down all over. So I don't know many, how many of you drive EVs, but I can't tell you how many times I've been driving and then been so disappointed that I can't charge <laughs> because it's broken. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our next question about green innovation. So although green tech has been around since the Industrial Revolution, um, it has gained a lot of prominence, of course, in the last couple of decades to address things like clean energy production, which we've talked about, use of alternative fuels, water scarcity and contamination, food insecurities, wildfires, um, excessive waste, uh, you name it. Um, 
we have tons of sustainability challenges and, and green tech is definitely one and a very important way to solve those. So from each of your perspectives, um, Michael, I'll start with you on this one. What major changes have you seen in your respective green tech sector over the, over the years? And what factors drove those changes? And then also if you could speak to whether COVID has accelerated any sort of change in that space. And then looking forward, um, what are you most excited about? Great questions. And there are several changes I've seen in green tech and clean energy over the last really 15 years, but you could say several decades. And that has been the price drop in wind and solar and now storage. Wind really led the way with its price drop. So clean energy is just cheaper than the earlier options. And that was certainly true for wind. And I feel like wind's just getting better with time. So like uh, wind has found its limit in terms of price effectiveness. And solar is now following the same curve, but with some delay compared to wind and storage, especially batteries, lithium ion storage, because of consumer electronics like our phones, they have a bunch of lithium ion batteries that's dropping the cost as well. And changing costs shifts a lot of the argument because for a lot of people for many decades, there was a push to go a certain direction with our technologies or our fuels and our different energy options because it felt better as philosophical or spiritual or environmental or better in some other way. But now you have a group of people that also want to go that way because it's cheaper or has higher performance. They might not care about the other elements. And this is a good news story when the economic answer is the same as the environmental answer and society converges on this. That's a major shift and that has changed things. And so we're now seeing price parity with wind or solar or storage or wind plus solar and storage and this kind of thing. And now that we're at a uh, sort of high natural gas price era right now, the last couple of weeks and months and oil price are very high, probably will stay high for months, the high price of fossil fuels. So that now they look like they're more volatile, more expensive, less reliable, makes the cleaner alternatives even more attractive. So that is a fundamental shift in the markets. It's pretty exciting. And what drove those changes was a mixture of consumer preference, people choosing for those philosophical reasons, but also just technological enhancement improvement, as well as some policies either through tax incentives or mandates or clarity on standards and that kind of thing. So the big shift for a variety of reasons, basically markets, policies, and technologies all align to give us cheaper, better options. And COVID sort of accelerates some of that because COVID in many ways is a slight shift from liquid transportation fuels for commuting to work to electric-based work from home. And if you look at the stats before COVID hit, about 4% of the American workforce worked from home on a regular basis. And at the peak of COVID back in, say, like May 2020 in the United States, it was like 50% because the rest were frontline workers who had to be there. But like something like 50% of people work from home. And that will go back down. I won't say 50% is already going back down, but it will go back to 4%. It'll go back to some higher number. And that shift is from gasoline to get us to work to electricity we use at home. And that will even accelerate the wind solar storage trends we already saw. So COVID has effect, I think, overall of serving as an accelerant for the trends that were already in place. And I think that's really fascinating. Frankly, there are a lot of reasons why that's good for our home life and that kind of thing. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. So Laura, um, coming from the same sector, um, <laughs> anything you'd ha like to add to that? I, I really could just say ditto, because um, <laughs> truly the, the just amazing declining costs that we've seen in wind and now we're seeing solar follow the similar trend has just been a game changer for the entire industry. Um, because Michael so eloquently covered all of those changes, mm -hmm. um, one other element that I thought that I've been a part of and it's been really interesting and rewarding is helping wind energy to be less intermittent. Uh, that's the biggest challenge when it first came onto the scene in, at scale is sometimes wind regimes are highly correlated. And so the, the system, as you know, can't store energy for the large part still. We're getting there, but still it's pretty, you got to have real time demand and supply match. And so when wind would ramp down, they'd have to find something else to ramp up. And it was becoming a reliability challenge in certain areas of the country. And so there's been huge, huge advancements in the meteorology and being able to really more accurately forecast when those ramps are going to come. There's been a lot of technological advancement in the SCADA systems, which are the, the technology systems that monitor the turbines and can respond and turn them on and off automatically. There's a lot of elements of adding capacity value to wind because now you know when it's going to show up on the system. We, we did a pilot program in the Pacific Northwest and we balanced our own um, 1400 megawatts of wind using hydro um, contracts and you know just flexible generation to bring to bear so that our product was a firm product throughout the hour. So I think that's made a big difference too because that what used to be the big 
downside to renewables is it's not reliable. And we're, we've just had huge advancements in that, which I think is great. In terms of what I'm most excited about, offshore wind, absolutely. And I have to tell you that Vestas' new 15 megawatt turbine is absolutely stunning and amazing. Um, it's larger than the London Eye. I mean, they're just these massive, massive machines that you honestly can't even imagine unless you see them up close. And it's coming. We're building here in the US, and I think it's going to be a really fascinating new industry. So, Great. So are either of you involved in the energy storage component of the energy sector? At, for us, we're really looking at green hydrogen now more seriously. Okay. There really, I think, are some really logical synergies where you could really power an electrolyzer during periods where there's too much wind on the system or too much energy on the system and not have to let that be curtailed and essentially wasted, right? right. Mm -hmm. So that's one that um, Vestas is looking in on the R&D side. And when I was at Engie, we certainly were doing kind of smaller scale storage um, that were pairing with PV um, solar. So. Okay, great, thank you. So Camille, from your perspective um, in the energy space, um, you know, what have you seen? This, this, as we know, has changed very rapidly as well. So what sort of trends have you, have you noticed over the years? Um, how, did impact, how did COVID impact um, what's been going on over the last year and a half? And then, and then what do you see um, for the EV and EV charging space uh, moving forward? Sure. I think the most interesting thing has been the sophistication in charging stations. So I think that it's like this, this ideal that charging stations are just these plugs on the wall, which they're actually not. Like they're actually the first um, public deployment of IoT assets, right? Like the charging stations that we're de seeing developed today, including the software that we're seeing developed today, are going to enable the grid to be smart and are going to enable um, demand response and load management. And then evil, even a lot of the things that are coming into play with the vehicles being able to speak to the grid. Like, there's so many things that are occurring with the charging stations and seeing, you know, from the beginning, almost five, only just five years ago for me, I just seeing charging stations that the best you could do was probably just like um, price management. But now today, there's so many new um, protocols that are being enacted to allow for us to just get smarter and better with charging. Um, the other piece that has been quite interesting has been this influx in workforce development and even this ideal of equity around the green transition and how do we think about involving more people? And that has been, I came from banking, right? And so coming into an industry where equity and workforce development and a just green transition being something that is the, the forefront um, it has been very, I think, powerful to see people actually think deeply about it. And it's important because sustainability, as I mentioned before, touches every single industry in some type of way because it is a health issue for everyone. Um, and then in regards to COVID, specifically in LA, we were able to see what it's like when we don't have a lot of gas powered cars on the road. Um, I, like I said, I live in South Central. I could have never seen the Hollywood Hills before. And I always just thought it was because it was far, but no, there's just this crazy <laughs> layer of pollution that had been blocking my view. Um, or even being able to go to the Getty Center and actually seeing the Long Beach ports. How insane. And we were only not able to see it because of all of the gas powered cars. And so we've, you know, had conversations. We employ, you know, technicians from all across the U.S. who are ex-oil and gas, who came from the cable industry, um, who are worked at factories. And a lot of them, just from being, you know, working with us and going through COVID to seeing it, they have switched over to electric vehicles, right? They can afford it. And then they've seen what happens when they, if gas vehicles don't exist. So that's very exciting. Um, and then your last question. Um, looking forward. So where do you see your industry going looking forward? Um, I think looking forward, what we hope for the industry is that while innovation is very exciting, um, it, can, it can have a lot of risk if we're not careful about how we go about innovation and we're not thoughtful on how the things that we build can impact people you know, poorly or not, right? And so I, I think that we're in a space where, where we can be thoughtful um, about the things that we're creating, right? Because it could just be one thing that you know, we create all these things that are, we think are clean and sustainable, and then in 10 years we find out that we missed something, right? And so I think that 
what I am excited about is I think that we are on the right path to really be aware of that. And um, we are on a path to start including more people to create companies, right? Like we built Charger Help the way that we did with W2 workers because my co-founder and I have experienced what happens when your parents are frontline workers that don't get paid a lot. So we built the company with the idea of how do we take care of frontline workers, right? But that's only because of our experience. So, no, we're very hopeful, but it's definitely something that we can't, you know, miss. We can't miss it. We just got to keep being innovative, but just be mindful of our innovations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which actually leads me to my next question that you already answered very eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> because I definitely wanted to, to touch on societal impact. And, um, you know, one of the things that is at the top of, of people's minds, of course, is climate change. And it's one thing that green technology over the course of the last several decades has been employed to help combat. Um, and sometimes in ways that have unintentional consequences. Um, sometimes it's something you thought was good, but then has a very negative impact. Um, it, it perhaps has a disproportionate impact where it's not something that can be of benefit or can be adopted by all types of individuals and or communities, et cetera. So we, we do sometimes see a big inequity in the way that uh, green technology is both developed and deployed. So um, I wanted to have each of you weigh in on, and if you, I'll, I'll start with you, Camille, since you already touched on this, if you want to add anything. So one, do you think green tech can reverse the impacts of climate change? And if so, how do we do it equitably? And you already gave a lot of great examples in a way that does not unintentionally create even greater disparities among communities. Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't think it's a matter of can we, we have to. Like, right. there's really, I don't think we have a choice at this point. <laughs> um, and the only thing that I would add is that, well, just to hammer down on the point that there's so many communities here in the US that have already embraced sustainability and already had practices that weren't, you know, wasteful, right? An example of that, in my community, like we, and I know in LA now, you, with the um, plastic bags, right? They don't have plastic bags because it's one use plastic. In my community, we use a plastic bag like five or six times, right? I use a plastic bag for my deep conditioning. I use a plastic bag to put in my trash can to take my trash out. And so there were already things that we were doing sustainably, even with like, if you ever go into a black home and see a, a, a um, what do you call it, the Betty Crocker um, butter bowl, like usually it has like leftovers in it. So there's like so many, or even like hand-me-down clothing. Like there's so many things that current communities have already done because they were forced to maybe because of poverty. However, they're sustainable and they're not wasteful. So I think that with that in mind, as we approach these questions of how not to harm others, it's really to be more inclusive for the solutions, right? It's to really to say that, some of us just have limited perspectives, maybe because of, um, because of privilege, right? And maybe this is an opportunity to take on someone else's ideal of how they see the world because they've had to live a life that they couldn't be wasteful. And so it's important to see these solutions as equals because we will miss it if we don't have other folks' perspectives. Right, right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Laura. Yes, I, I would say I am so encouraged by the movement that we're seeing in this critical area. And it's in some ways, it's disappointing. And I have to wear personal responsibility for that as well. This industry really woke up, I feel like, last summer with the murder of George Floyd. And I've seen a very stark change where the industry is like, oh my God, we're supposed to be progressive. We're supposed to be a part of the solution and we have been vastly ignoring underserved communities and really working to ensure that we have this transition, but it's a just transition. And across the board, we're seeing it. Every company needing, I have a, we work in a coalition called American Clean Power Association. Every CEO is, has a diversity and inclusion committee in their companies. And we're all talking about workforce development and trying to ensure that we go out in the communities where these facilities are and ensuring that they are reaping the benefits, the economic benefits of this technology and this infrastructure in their communities. And it's, it's, we've got so far to go. We have so far to go. But I see a really significant marker and a change, and we're committed. And I think that's the key. And we've just got to keep 
moving and making sure that we take those perspectives and we don't bring our own assumptions and our life experiences because we're missing it, right? And so to me, I, I see a really big change and it's something um, I'm personally very committed to and it's been a huge learning journey for me personally. And it's um, something that I, I feel is an absolute must if we're going to be able to move forward where we need to be as a society. Yeah, even the term uh, green technology, you look it up and it's, it's to address um, environmental issues and to, you know, uh, and natural resources, but it actually does not talk about an equity component in the definition. Mm -hmm. If you look, you know, just look it up online, it doesn't, it doesn't touch on that. So sustainability has been the same over the years where sustainability has three pillars of environment, economics, and equity. And people have been calling things sustainable that are in fact not sustainable for decades, right? Because the equity component has often been overlooked. Michael, did you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, a couple of comments. Um, so I want to reference what Camille and Laura said. So Laura mentioned like the industry woke up after George Floyd's murder. And I would say the George Floyd murder was a turning point. It wasn't the first example of unnecessary violence. It wasn't the first death of a black man at the hands of a police officer. But there's something about it that captured the attention of different communities. I would say like it captured the attention of whites and industry differently than other events. And so I see that with my students and I see that with a lot of people I do. So something changed. It finally, with the public conscience changed. So that does feel like it was a turning point in many ways. And I think we're still feeling the re repercussions and also some pushback against those repercussions, by the way. So in, in Texas, we're feeling like a lot of people are pushing back against the reactions to George Floyd's murder. So there was a turning point. And then Camille mentioned a couple of things that are important. One is like reducing waste is a great first step, whatever you're doing. Like uh, there are a lot of solutions that are technology oriented, but just using the same things multiple times and reducing waste is a key first step because that makes the hurdle lower that you have to clear. And then she also mentioned earlier, several minutes ago, about uh, people she knows with asthma and this kind of thing. And we think about the inequities of energy. The inequities of energy are normally around inequity in access to energy or inequities in who feels the pollution. And there are a lot of fence line communities suffering from the pollution. Just yesterday, the CEOs of many uh, major oil and gas companies were at a hearing of a, a House committee. And Congresswoman Cory Bush was asking the oil and gas executives, if you have a refinery, is it more likely to be in a black community or a white community? And they didn't answer. She said, Black. It's going to be in the black community. If you have a CEO of an oil and gas company, it's more likely to be a white person or a black person. And they didn't answer. She says the answer is they're white. So you have white decision makers in black people or brown people feeling the impacts of this. On the global scale, this is particularly clear because the billion people who don't have access to clean energy tend to be in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, this kind of thing. And the people making the decisions are not them. So we have inequities that way. Cleaner energy can solve a lot of these equity issues. The labor workforce is different. The oil and gas and coal mining workforce is much wider than the wind industry or electric utilities industry. So as we go from oil and gas and coal to more electric utilities, if the workforce composition stays the same, it will diversify naturally just because that's happening and maybe we can even promote that and celebrate it and accelerate it. That's good news. The pollution for fence line communities should go down. That's good news but equity won't naturally happen for everything. For example, if we look at the early adopters of the EVs, like we already heard, the electric vehicles or rooftop solar, that is mostly rich white communities or people. So it, the, the poorer communities or black and brown communities aren't the ones getting first access to solar panels, electric cars. So some equities might get solved naturally, some inequities might get propagated and we need to be mindful of that, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of really great points, Michael. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to our last uh, prepared question before I before I take questions from the audience. And I just want to re remind the audience again that in Slido, you can um, ask a question using the code TNSP2. TNSP2. So I have a couple here, but if you want to add some questions. Um, but before, before I go to those, um, I want to ask each of the panelists, I'll start with you, Michael. Um, and this is more around the idea of uh, career advice, um, since we're speaking to a lot of students today. Um, so would you, would you share from your perspective what you think some key skill sets, tools, or traits you think are critical for success as a green tech entrepreneur or somebody who's interested in, a, in doing a, a tech startup or working at a tech startup? And then if you were to do it over, is there anything you would change? 
Uh, the great question. Uh, nothing I would change in my path. I'm, I really enjoy the path I've had between startups and academia and macro corporate world like NG. So I really enjoy what I've learned and I, I wish everyone has multiple career steps. So I guess one point is I didn't go to one job and stay there my entire career. I've had multiple jobs. I'll probably have some more changes in the future. And I think that's something that's available today that wasn't available, say, 60 years ago, where people would go to one company and stay there 40 years and you would trust that that company would take care of you with a pension and that kind of thing. That doesn't really happen today people are more likely to move around. And I would say that labor flexibility is a key component. If we want our capitalistic market system to work, it, require, it requires efficiency in the labor markets as well, which means that people need to be able to move around and take different jobs and have a lot of flexibility. And I think that this is a very exciting time for that in energy. What I look at, and actually I'm creating an online executive course in January to try to solve this. There's a labor market dislocation right now. I'm getting multiple emails every week from clean energy companies like Vestas and others, desperate to find people. And they're saying, do you have any students we can hire? But all the energy students I have who have a clean energy credential have like three jobs already. Meanwhile, Houston laid off 60,000 people in oil and gas last year alone, just Houston and a gas company, Apache, laid off like a third of their workforce. There's a lot of oil and gas workers who are available, a lot of search for clean energy people, and the labor market's not solving this naturally. So there's an opportunity here for the students to, to get a jump on this. And I think we need to kind of bridge this gap because the skill sets you need to succeed in clean energy are kind of the same as the others. You need to be a collaborative person, you need to be reliable, you need to be honest and ethical. There are all the same things that are success. Maybe there's some different programming, maybe you need to know Python or R, or different languages. I would have learned Fortran when I was a student. So maybe the computer languages are different, but the skill sets are gonna be the same. And I think more than anything, you have to be nimble and a critical thinker. Nimble as a thinker, meaning the thing you are mastering today might not be the thing you're doing 30 years from now. We cannot, as professors, train you for the skills you need 30 years from now, but we can train you to think and to learn so that you can be a self-learner for those 30 years and, and, and be ready for those changes. And there's all, actually all, often this tension at universities, are we training or teaching? And I think we should be teaching because then if you teach someone, they can be trained or self-trained the rest of their life. So I think you're right. There's so many job opportunities right now. There's such a growth sector. This is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. If we look just at Texas alone, decarbonizing by 2050, we'll create like a million jobs in Texas. And then it'll be even more in California and other places. So this is the thing to go after. And it's very exciting. I'm really excited. I, I guess the only thing I do over is I kind of wish I were in my 20s again so I could see the excitement of this rise. Um, but I really optimistically... I'm very happy for you, but I also can't wait because the thing we need more than anything else, I would say, is fresh leadership. So I was thinking about this, and I know I'm going too long with my answer, but in the presidential election in 2020, we had a late 70s candidate, Donald Trump, against a late 70s candidate, Joe Biden, with now an 80-year-old Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and this 79-year-old Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader. Nothing wrong with people in their 70s and 80s, but I feel like maybe there's someone in their 50s or younger who can offer some leadership as well. And so I really want millennials and Gen Z to get into leadership positions quickly. A lot, just your mindset and your values will change a lot of this. So the sooner we get going, the better, I would say. Wow, thank you. I love that answer. Um, definitely learn learn how to be critical thinkers and, uh, and leaders. Um, and, and you can do just about anything you want to. <laughs> Um, Camille, what would you like to add to that? Sure, and my suggestions are actually more to the, the companies than the students, because I think that the mismatch actually has more to do with how companies are looking at jobs and recruitment, period, right? And we see this often where folks will come to us at how we would do our recruitment, and they say, well, how, how were you able to get so many people to apply to jobs? So, for example, our cohort of technicians was 20 spots, we had 1,600 people apply to those 20 positions. And the reason why we had that much amount of people apply is really for three reasons. The one was how the job description was laid out. We don't require a high school diploma or, or a college degree um, for the jobs. We actually look more towards what were your previous experiences, and not necessarily what were your previous work experiences, but specific experiences that um, highlight certain skill sets that we're looking for. Right, and some of the same things that was mentioned earlier. Are you a collaborative person? Are you nice? <laughs> right, people like to work with nice people. Yeah. Right. You know, but then how? And then we've been developing out assessments on how can we tell? You know, there's some other skill sets, but how can we find that out from somebody's experience? So one of the things that we do with our technicians, it's a two-month hiring process. It's very intensive, 
But a part of it, we actually borrowed from, I had a lot of friends that actually went to MBA and went to McKinsey's and the Deloitte's, and a part of their recruitment process is sitting in a room and having to come together um, to come with a solution through a case, mm -hmm. right? So we borrow that same type of mechanism to identify the emotional intelligence and how our technicians work with one another. So we provide them with cases, like things that might happen in the field, and we tell them they have to come up with the five best next steps and they have to agree on it. And we're in the room, right, through Zoom, and we have our cameras off. We don't care what they come up with, but we look at how they work with one another. Mm -hmm. Who cuts people off? Who's collaborative? Who's referencing past experiences? And we were able to learn so many things about our technicians just in that moment about them interacting with one another than we would have learned if we just did oh, just one hire, you know, one interview, right? So I think that it's really on companies to start reimagining how we should recruit people and how we should retain people. The last thing that I'll say is that within technology of how our technicians go out and fix stations, if folks don't know, 80% of the issues of charging stations are non-electrical. They're all software issues. It's a lot of bugs, firmware. It's a lot of things you have to be able to deduce while you're in the field. So I can't teach that to you, right? But I can utilize our mobile app in order to guide you through workflows in order to make sure that you're successful. So that technical component, I've been able to solve for. So that way, when I go out to recruit, I'm looking for the soft skills. But we had to change that mindset because we didn't have EVSC technicians that I can go <laughs> recruit from. It doesn't exist, right? But we had to really <laughs> rethink it, reimagine it. So I think that it's really the onus is on companies to really look at these positions, specifically within clean tech, where people may not have that background, and figure out how do I, number one, recruit a little bit differently to find the right skill sets, and number two, have mechanisms, whether it's through technology or human resources within the company that helps bridge that technical gap, right? Because you can find great people that want to learn, that want to be engaged, that may not necessarily show up right on their resume. Yeah. I love it. I'm going to use that when I start uh, my next hire. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's really okay. Yes, that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, Laura. Yeah, hard to follow both of those answers. Um, I, I would echo Michael's comments in terms of just there's no substitution for hard work and curiosity. You know, there's so many different areas that you could take your career. And I, I feel like my career in so many ways has been like a Plinko board, you know, and it's just you see something that interests you, you dive in, you offer to help and get involved, and pretty soon a new opportunity comes up because you've kind of learned that language, you've now got a network in there. And so I would just say, don't limit yourself and don't beat yourself up if where you think you want to go isn't where you end up, because very rarely that's the case. Um, in terms of, and before I say um, regrets in my career, I will tell you, I have 250 job openings in just my service technicians in the field right now. Um, we have 250 wind plants across the United States, and we are really, really having a hard time finding enough talent for people to come and do this. And it's not an easy job. You're working at heights. Mm -hmm. You're you know, working in high risk areas in a lot of instances. It's hard work, it's physical work, but it's amazing work. And our technicians are some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. But it is, it's a huge challenge. And I love your idea of thinking differently about how to recruit. Um, in terms of if I could do something differently, the one thing that I always look back and kick myself for Early in my career, I did not appreciate just how valuable your network is. Mm -hmm. Write down the names of people that you sit on a panel with. Mm -hmm. Write down, you know, make, keep contact with people all across the industry that you come in contact with because you cannot imagine how often you'll find a, you're like, oh my God, I remember I was on a panel with that woman. What was her name? She had this experience. This could be so valuable. And if I had just kept up some sort of, you know, option to contact her without looking like a complete jerk, like, oh, hi, mm -hmm. I haven't talked to you in two years, but now I need something from you. You know, and so just really treasure your network. Keep that open. Make relationships because in the end, it is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, indeed. So, Camille, when we talked um, yesterday, you, I don't think you talked about this today, but you you discussed ways that you retain your workforce. So, mm -hmm. what are some of the benefits you offer your workforce? I mean, I know you started with the the base pay was thirty dollars an hour, for example, but you did have these other things that you were offering. Sure. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, when I got into tech, I was just um, taken back by just like how many perks there are. 
<laughs> you know, and I think I saw somebody write this just like, man, like if there was as many perks for tech as for teachers, right? And just like there's so many things we can borrow from tech. And so that's what we really wanted to bring into blue collar workers, right? And so for us, right, so we start off at $30 an hour. We guarantee 40 hours of work. They're all employees. We pay um, health care insurance. We pay into their health care insurance. And they're a part of uh, Trinet, which is ones that all the tech companies use, so it's good health care. Um, and then we also offer shares and equity into the company because it's this ideal that, like, really the only way that we're going to be successful is that when you get on the job that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So why not own a piece of that as being a, a, a owner of the company? Um, and then, of course, a 401k. And then we do things like we fly them to L.A. for, like, the training or we send them swag bags. Like, we really looked at, like, where were some of these cool things in tech and how can I bring that to a blue-collar worker that worked on oil feed? for like the last 20 years, right? It's a whole new experience, a whole new um, loyalty that you get from people uh, when you start really thinking about their livelihood because the happy they are, right? The more that you can retain on that person, which is, you know, way less expensive if they leave, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's very expensive. <laughs> so we have just a couple minutes left, and I have just two questions that came in through Slido, and one of them is specifically to you, uh, Dr. Weber. <laughs> um, can you, if I might, can you talk about the potential of using lithium-ion batteries to replace fossil fuel diesel backup generators and any fire safety concerns? This is huge for Los Angeles because we are... Well, we have committed to uh, going off of those power generators, for example. Great question and great point about uh, thermal runaway, which is the polite way of saying a lithium ion battery uh, a fire. <laughs> so lithium ion batteries, prices have come down, performance goes up, but the, the price fall is reminiscent of what wind went through over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's not just for consumer electronics or your EVs, your electric vehicles anymore. It's also for utility scale backup. The 100 megawatt one was installed years ago um, by Tesla in Australia, and it has very fast response time. So one of the good things about batteries is they can respond in about 100 milliseconds or less. So at grid scale, if you have a frequency event, you can get fast response on batteries. The downside is they tend to be bulky and it's hard to get like a week's worth of storage. So most storage systems are like four hours. In California, there's a long duration energy storage requirements, which targets eight hours. But if you look at California weather, there are periods of five, seven, nine, or 11 days that are windless and cloudy. And so you want something that's where the green hydrogen, the ore mentioned earlier, might be really valuable, or lithium ion batteries are part of it. And lithium batteries are really good for the shorter periods for something else you might need pumped hydroelectric or the fuels. The fires are non-trivial. You do get thermal runaway. You get the, these dendrites that form between the anode and cathode. You can get a fire, and it's not a fire like you and I would experience fire, where if you snuff out the oxygen, it, it quits burning because it's not that kind of fire. You have to just cool it down a lot. And actually, the firefighting techniques are, are getting developed. And something we did at NG, we had tests where we'd look at controlling this. It's mostly around cooling down and slowing down the reactions. You, you can't fight it with fire. You can't fight it with foam. And that's something to think about. However, the risk of that fire for a place like Southern California is lower than the sparks or soot or ash or heat of diesel generators, which might have a hot particular matter fly out and land in a dry patch. So there is risk of fire from everything. And generally speaking, lithium ion batteries are better than burning stuff when it comes to California situation. Um, we don't have any time. I would love to ask more questions about the lithium <laughs> trade-offs, the equity you know, components, and the other environmental mm -hmm. issues around lithium ion. But that's for another day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the last question here, um, I think maybe um, is directed more at Laura. Um, how is the industry doing to overcome the weather issues when there isn't enough wind? And I know you touched on this a bit. Can wind energy be stored in something similar to Tesla's Powerwall? So I think you touched on this a bit. Yeah, I mean, we definitely have paired wind projects with storage projects. Um, the efficiencies aren't great. Um, the cost is not great. So this is why you don't see this building out at a large scale. To get to Michael's point, there are periods of time, sometimes days, where wind just is low and you don't have wind. And so you really need longer term storage and that's the pumped hydro. And now really, I feel like green hydrogen is, is it's coming onto the scene. I, I think we'll get some incentives in place through the federal government, which will be a helpful push to this and then you start to get to scale and you'll see the cost efficiencies come down. There's a project right now in Delta, Utah, and it's a, a JV between Mitsubishi and Magnum, and they've got underground salt cavern storage. 
and they have a vision, and it's possible technologically, that they will essentially repower the big thermal units there. They have huge, like, couple thousand megawatts of thermal units that have a high voltage line directly into LA, actually, LADWP. And they're talking about refurbishing that and making it gas fired, but then over time making that green, 100% clean hydrogen fired. And so the technology is coming that you can start blending that, and then over time it can be 100% green hydrogen. That would be fueled by renewables. And renewables can power that electrolyzer and it can store it underground. And this is where we get seasonal storage. You could feasibly have days, even weeks, maybe even months of storage right there at your disposal and just create that firm power across the board. Now we're not there yet. It's not cost effective yet, but it's coming. And that's the kind of long-term storage I think that you really need to pair with renewables. And it's going to be critical in offshore. Okay, thank you. We're at time. I think uh, we're, I'm standing between lunch and, <laughs> and such. So I will just be very brief in our summary and thanking the panelists. Um, so I, I hope this was really helpful and informative today. We covered a bit on how the, the technology sectors are interacting, what's next in green innovation, hopefully some career advice that will be helpful to all of you, and of course, touching on how clean technology should be just technology. So thank you so much, Camille, Laura, and Michael for phoning in today, videoing in today, um, and thanks so much to everyone here and um, online for, for listening in. Excellent. Great job. Thank you very much. So I want to do a couple of takeaways uh, for the whole session, and it's basically based on this what and how uh, that I will take away from, uh, from the several uh, panels that we had. Um, let me start out with the what. You know, first of all, the role that technology's got in fundamental areas in our lives, not niche high-end areas, but things that are fundamental to how we live our lives. So. Things that are like energy, water, life sciences, we talked about last night, transportation, financial services in the emerging markets. These are huge areas of, uh, of opportunity. The point that um, John made, Michael made uh, earlier, that innovation is gonna occur. You're not gonna stop the innovation and it's fundamental to modernity. It's a very kind of fundamental activity of, uh, of a society. And COVID has accelerated many of the trends, adoption of digital, uh, et cetera, adoption of alternative energy sources, et cetera. It's also accelerated a divide, a divide in almost all of these businesses. So something for us to, to remember. On the house, several hows here, understand context. Uh, Juan talked about this last night when he said, look at the environment that somebody is in, what they have before you pass judgment on them. Um, uh, Olav, in his own summary, when he talked about startups, said, understand the enablers that will allow a startup and entrepreneurial environment to, uh, to occur. Second main how, um, think about your role as a leader in managing innovation. And I always find it helpful to say, what are the actual practices that people are focusing on? Um, transparency principles, uh, bias meters, thinking about underserved communities, which uh, this panel I thought did an especially great job of uh, focusing on, precision regulation for the bad players out there where you have to have regulation. Uh, uh, think about all of those. And then the final message is here about the importance of taking risks, collaborating, and then thinking laterally and expansively. So if we go back to Juan last night, very lateral thinker, and very expansive thinker, also a bunch of warnings in there. And then think about the, all the panels today that talked about you gotta take risks, you've gotta work with others to create better outcomes, and you've gotta uh, uh, have forward momentum. So let me just uh, say in closing a bunch of thank yous um, here. I want to thank our speakers. You know, these conferences are only as good as the speakers and what they have to share as their insights. Our moderators are the ones that ensure that the conversations are terrific. Um, I wanna thank the student planning committee that did a lot of work here to think about topics, panelists, outreach, et cetera. I wanna thank the Easton team. 
Um, these events are like weddings when you put them on. They look easy and all that. There's a million details underneath it. So it's uh, Heather and it's Darina and it's uh, Jamie. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you for your participation um, here. Your participation makes the dialogue rich and I hope contributes to your own leadership journey. Um, we will now, for those of you that are here or those that are remote that can quickly get here, we're gonna have a, a, a lunch out on the uh, North Terrace. So thank you guys all very much. Take care.